Welcome to Syntax. Today we've got a, a episode for you on local first development, lo-fi, which is super cool. Scott's like, we're going to do an episode on lo-fi. And I was like, what the hell is that? That sounds cool. Some sort of like <laughs> sick library for like making tunes or something like that. But uh, it, it means local first. And uh it's approaching your applications so that they work offline first, sort of how like sometimes people think like like uh, mobile first, right? You think about your applications as a mobile app first and then you scale up rather than the opposite. So local first is thinking about your applications of like what happens when the internet cuts out and then what happens when we, we reconnect. So Scott has dove deep into this topic. So excited to talk to him all about that. How are you doing today, Scott? Hey, I'm doing good. You know what? About 10 minutes ago, it was a uh, clear sky. And right now, there's like already half Same. a It's thundering here right now. If oh, no. Hear, not, oh, it, oh, okay. Oh, it, it is a certified winter wonderland. Uh, it is like coming Denver's down. Denver's wild. That is wild yeah. that Denver's just like warm and snowing in like the it same week. It was like week. 60 and sunny yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hold on. 60 what is that in the for the rest of the world oh warm 15.5 thank you for for converting for the rest of the world that makes a lot of sense um let's talk about my t-shirt um <laughs> i will tell you right now i will do anything for a t-shirt um you can you can ask you can ask me to pay me money you can ask me to, to take me out for lunch on talk about your company <laughs> sometimes maybe whatever you send me like a, a t-shirt I'll do literally anything for a t-shirt, um, which is a weird part of tech where that we will do this. So um, this company dress code sent me this and uh, there sometimes people will reach out and be like, Hey, we have this like crappy print on demand coding t-shirts where they just like have these crappy t-shirts. And, and I got this one. I was like, Oh, this is another one of those. Right. But I was like, I checked it. Out. I was like, this is actually sick. So check this out. Dress code ha is makes these tees for, Oh yeah. Um, super good quality, like super high quality, kind of like more of a boxy modern fit. Um, and he hit me up. Is a the guy behind it is a, a product manager at Microsoft. Um, and he said, Hey, I'm I'm making like a black owned tech inspired clothing brand called Dress Code. Um, and obviously the dude knows a little bit about making sweet shirts, and that's something I'm really into. So he sent one. He's gonna send one to Scott as well. So Scott will probably wear his on a future app as well. But certainly check out Dress Code if you are interested in cool shirts. Look at the, even like this. There's like a cool. Oh yeah. QR they code. They got a great logo. Apparently there's like a whole bunch of fun experiences if you scan that. I haven't done that yet, but. Um, they have a really cool mission behind STEM and, and furthering it. So check it on out. Thanks, Dress Code. Um, yeah. Not for sponsoring, but thanks for this free shirt. And again, I'll do anything for a free shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you got shirts out there, just, just send them along. And this podcast is presented by Century. So if you need air tracking in your software, and this stuff that I'm about to get into in this episode is complex. Let me tell you, I have you know, really <laughs> spend some time in here. And it's, it, unfortunately, it's not super easy. And with anything like that, you're bound to make some mistakes. Now, when we have all these systems that we're about to talk about, you know, there's a ton of potential for things in syncing process, in saving process, anything to go awry or to not behave like you're expecting it, and your visibility on that's going to be super low. So if you want to have high visibility into your applications, head on over to sentry.io forward slash syntax, sign up and get two months for free. And uh, it's just an awesome tool. So let's get into local first. Now, local first or lo-fi, which honestly, even if you Google lo-fi local first, man, the lo-fi beats to, to code to or to study to has like really <laughs> dominated Google. So uh, if you're trying to research this stuff, I've included a massive amount of links, including this uh, this really good one, which is localfirstweb.dev, which that in itself has a massive amount of links. So if you're, if you're looking for further information on this, it's going to be tough to Google, and I've tried to include everything as, as you, you know, would need so in this episode. So... I think the the big thing here is that the local first movement, as as it's so put, or local first development, 
is more than maybe what you're thinking in terms of, hey, it works offline. The way that they've defined this lo-fi movement of coding is through several things. And these are these are the kind of principles in which they call them the seven ideals of local first. And and I've pulled this directly from this Ink and Switch blog post. Um, so this, these are not my own words, but I'll, I'll do my best to try to explain some of these. And you'll see different projects in this space representing all or maybe some of these ideals. So number one, no spinners. They want instant loading. And you can really get instant loading like in terms of from your database calls or your, your data, if you're loading from an index DB locally, I mean, like for very minimal data, you could get as low as like 20 milliseconds. And it's for complex data, you know, you're only getting up to a couple hundred milliseconds, which is a far cry from a network call, right? Yeah, I'm sure you're going to get into this, but index DB is the web API. It's a database in the browser. Um, it's a set of APIs to interact with a database that actually lives inside of your browser. It's similar to local storage, but way more powerful and a little bit more complex to get into, whereas local storage is just key value strings, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you were saving data in this kind of context, uh, like a full application, you're, you're not going to put it into local storage. Um, you could think if you're trying to sync your database, you're going to put it into index DB. There's some other options there too. Um, people are doing some crazy stuff with WASM and uh, SQLite, but for the most part, number one ideal, no spinners. They want that data to load quickly. It's on your device already. It shouldn't take any time to load. Two, your work should not be trapped on one device. As in, if you go to your phone, your computer, whatever, that information should be able to sync from one device to another, okay? Um, and it should happen preferably in real time. So that way, if I do something on my phone, it goes to my computer. Now- Really? Yeah, Without a server? There's gotta be a server though, right? There is a server, and this is part of the, that we're going to get into. Okay. Is that local first does not necessarily mean offline first. Server, offline serverless, only. less. Correct. Yes. And what fact, is no there, serverless? I, dude, <laughs> it is very funny because one of the the one of the things I watched when they they were describing they came up with the lo-fi name, they were like, at first I wanted to call this serverless, but then. The serverless folks took that, so I couldn't call it serverless, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. Um, okay, so those are the two 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 initial or two initial ideals. Third one is the network is optional. Notice how it says optional and not required. So the network will be used for initial loading of the app. It will be used for syncing your data. It will be used for bringing in new data from the synced database, those types of things. But the network should not be a requirement to use your app generally. And this is for a number of reasons beyond just working offline. It's so that if your network conditions are changing, the app experience doesn't change. If you're loading everything locally again, it's going to be fast. It's going to be on device. Okay, um, the, the most like reasonable thing I could say is like it's a, it's an app on your phone that functions very much like a native app. Um, Obsidian comes to mind, right? You can work in Obsidian whether there's a network or not. And when the network connects, it syncs. So seamless collaboration with your colleagues, aka multiplayer stuff. This is, you know, you see this a lot where, you know, Wes and I are editing the same Notion document. That is seamless collaboration with your colleagues. So that is a tenant of, uh, or an ideal of local first, which is funny because when I was researching uh, multiplayer stuff, we did this for my Hack Week project at Century. I did a kind of a document editor, a multiplayer document yeah. editor. You see so many of the same folks, so many of the same projects, so many of the same connections with a different goal in mind, right? Uh, the multiplayer specifically is a goal for collaboration, but it also plays an important part in offline first software, or lo local first software. Next up is security and privacy by default. Everything should be encrypted, right? Stored on your device, it's yours, it should be encrypted. That's part of their ideals. Next up is that you retain ownership and control. Hey, the app is on your device, but also 
you can export that data. Yeah, if you ever see the actual budget project from James Long, um, that's a good example of this because, again, these these files are local. You can <laughs> export them. You can import files. You can move them around. Um, one of the things they often talk about is like, hey, if the service goes down and you have the app on your phone, the app should just not stop working. Uh, maybe they take the app down. It's yours. You should be able to use it. Yeah. You want to want to hear a crazy story about that? Um, yes. So this this company, I, I won't name them because I'm I'm sure they're actually trying to fix the, fix it. But they email me say, hey, check out our new note taking application. It's kind of like a mix between mind mapping and uh, and note taking, which is something I've wanted forever. Like I I always do mind mapping and then I always do notes, but like connecting them together, I've never found something that has been been perfect for me. And they came out with that, and I was like, sweet, like I'm gonna try this. So I I started like. Um, making a course in that. And, and then I came back to it like two months later and they had given me like a three month trial and that trial had run out and mm. I was not able to access my notes. Um, like it was gone and, and like, no, I logged in and it's just as like, bloop, like here's the credit card form if you want to whatever. And I don't, I don't think that was out of malice, but it was, it showed me that like, man, that's not local first at all. That's <laughs> yeah. somebody else's app. And if you stop paying, you lose absolutely everything. Pretty dicey. Yeah. And I think about this a lot with Obsidian, right? Which is one of the reasons why I like it so much. The yeah. only thing that Obsidian doesn't do well is multiplayer stuff, right? Like you and I can't edit an Obsidian doc reliably at the same time, at least not in the same way we can in Notion. But I like about Obsidian is that it is a folder of markdown files. I could yes. go and publish them to my website. I could go and uh, open them up in VS Code, and it doesn't have any impact on whether or not I'm able to use those files. So if, if Obsidian goes away for some reason, I still have every single. You note still that have I've ever markdown. Written. That's yeah. we've said that so many times on this this show. Is if whether considering whether to buy into a proprietary thing or not. Like, do you go MySQL or do you go Firebase? You know, and you get a lot a more with Firebase, yeah. right? But then. Uh, if, when, when Google shuts them down, <laughs> you are screwed. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those things, even in projects right now within this episode. Uh, but I've also, you know, if you want a good reading on these ideals and their general thoughts on them, this ink and switch, uh, blog post, I have linked directly below these in the show notes is like the best place to get a great handle on just the the big picture of local first if you like in-depth reading because this is it's a big read but it's a really good read they, they talk about like all these different softwares and compare them and say all right are they fast multi-device offline collaboration longevity privacy do they have user control and then you know there, there's a lot of great information here so uh you're probably thinking like i was after uh getting a nice little intro to this stuff holy cow it all sounds amazing. Let's go. <laughs> Let's just do this. Let's do local first, huh? Yeah. And then uh, that's where the the fun part comes in because nobody has really, I mean, there are people who are like attempting to nail the local first complete solution. The problem with a local first complete solution is this stuff is hard. This stuff is complex. And typically, most people aren't starting a new project you're working on a project and you might say, oh, man, maybe local first would be a good opportunity here. Well, that's not really, you didn't have the opportunity to do a local first. So now I have this whole tech stack. What do I do with my tech stack, right? Yeah. Um, but if you are looking to, to start a new project, there are some new services that we'll talk about later on that do get you more things out of the box with less effort, but they do require some buy-in. They do require subscription costs. They do require things like that. So there's a whole dimension of how much do you want to do yourself and how much pain would you like to have in your life? <laughs> because uh, <laughs> we'll talk about how complex this stuff is, but I it can't, gets pretty I, crazy. I, am just, I, I, I know it's coming up, but I cannot wait to find out the answer to what happens when two people edit the same thing and both come online well, after. The answer is uh, in this very first thing under I have here, the next heading is the tech. And a big thing that you'll see over and over in the space is the uh, acronym CRDT, Conflict-Free Replicated Data Types. 
And a conflict-free replicated data type is basically how you do just that. How you take two bits of changes and know which one took place and how to conflict-free merge those changes, merge that data. CRDTs are the thing that kind of powers the whole syncing engine, right? You have a change in your local database. You have a change in your remote database. How do I know which of those is the most updated one? But not only that, you have a change on one device. You have a change on another device. Yeah. How do you know which of those changes the most? Run into Maybe that you have many a change times. on Wes's computer and a change on my computer. How do you know which one of those goes in in what the order they they get updated into the document? Because it's not happening simultaneously. It's it's happened on Notion a few times. Like I've gone offline before, and then you've edited something, and I've edited it, and then I come back online, and it it can't resolve that because what I had changed is no longer there. So how how do you do it, Scott? I'm dying to know. Well, you use a CRDT, of which there is a lot of these things, and many of which are not a ton of fun to use. The The big boy in this space is YJS. Now, YJS has a learning curve. I'm going to tell you that right now. Now, I have a repo that I'll post into the show notes that shows the same app in both YJS and Replicash. But YJS is really the high-performance CRDT that has a big community, that has a lot of people using it, and is more of a lower level tool to build these conflict resolution things, okay? So you can hook up a CRDT to a WebSocket server, and you can hook it up to an index DB. And in those two steps of hooking those two things up, you can keep two browser windows in sync. Next thing you do, you hook that <laughs> YJS up to your server, your API server, then you get it syncing to your database server. Now those aspects are much more tough and we'll talk about some services there. So the tech is you need CRDTs the con to conflict free res uh, merge your data. Um, yep. There are others of these, but again, YJS is the biggest one. There are easier ones of these, but many of them do cost money to use. There's licensing fees involved. YJS is free and open source. Um, but it is probably the most difficult. Can I, can I just say it's a total missed opportunity to call it crudete.js? Oh, yeah, bro. Come on. It's not even, it's yeah. it's on NPM. It's open. The, whole, the it, How rare is it that a single word NPM package is available and CRDTs are called crudites? That's, I don't know how to spell that, I'm going to be honest with you. What? I don't know how to spell crudite. Crudite. Oh, you're not French. I'm not. Yeah, we don't. Uh, yeah, yeah, we call marmots marmots. <laughs> Mamo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Anyway, so but like at, at some point you're gonna have a, a conflict where that you cannot resolve, right? Like at some I've had this with, with my VS code settings, you've had it with Git as well. Is is there some solution to when you do have a merge conflict at some point? Like I as YJS probably covers most of them, but if both people are both offline and we both change the same word to different word, what's the what happens then? You just tell the user hey, something happened, or, or you can you could say which one you want to keep? Yeah, I think the answer is that it does its best. What you're not, you're not going to yeah. get from this is you're not getting like a... Like a Git um, interface or... Yes. My understanding is that because this stuff is deep, the algorithms are... There's different types of CRDT algorithms. My yeah. understanding is that this uses uh, like timing involved in like a, an actual... Uh, a specific clock that has like a central clock, not these two users' laptops clocks, essentially, that are able to say, you know, the last one out is the, the winner. The um, NPT. And yeah. it's probably smart enough that like, like, you know, how Git sometimes will like, all right, you both change the same sentence, but I'll, I can figure it out, you know, like you didn't change the both the same words of a sentence. So I can, I can merge those two things into each other. That's cool. Yes. I didn't even realize that this was a thing other than Git. Yes, it's a thing, and it's a thing that powers a lot of these multiplayer apps that you see. YJS specifically is a very widely used um, project for doing that type of thing. There's yeah. a really good um, talk from .js from James Long called CRDTs for Mortals, which uh, does its best <laughs> to explain these things for normal people, and I think it does a great job. All right, more, more on the tech here, WebSockets. Definitely used WebSockets. Typically, you know, there there's ways to do it with WebRTC, but the way that people are doing 
typically syncing data is with WebSockets. You use a WebSocket to connect to other machines or other windows that are opening the same app in the same room necessarily. Or you use WebSockets to talk to your server so that when you make a change locally, that server also gets that change so it can save in the database, right? Or yeah. perhaps the database needs to sync with the client, and therefore you're getting that information through a WebSocket. Um, more tech here, IndexedDB. We went over it's the local database. Again, some people are storing things in SQLite, uh, but most people are doing indexed DB for this. Uh, the SQLite stuff is some proprietary, interesting stuff going on. Maybe um, some different projects doing interesting things there. Ninety nine percent of the time, indexed DB. Uh, you last know, piece of sorry, I did one more thing I want to say is, okay. you know how I can tell that this local first thing is going to be big. Um, after doing a little bit of research on it, there's two people that popped up: is is Nick Graf and Johannes Schickling and oh, they're yeah. both yeah. they're both working on projects in the space and they're they were both early Prisma GraphQL folks as well you know like they they saw that and sort of jumped on it and now they're they're both working in this space yes it's gonna yeah, be there's big. some really really smart talented folks we're bringing all kinds of different interesting projects here and we'll talk a little bit about some of those and what they can do but most of those projects that you might want to check out are on localfirstweb.dev. Um, the last bit of interesting talk here is service workers. Um, a service worker is basically caching the code that you need to run your site, to run it offline. Um, if So if you think about it, and I have, I have a, a repo that I'll share with everybody that shows bare bones examples for this, but if you have a service worker that's loading the code and you have an index DB that is fetching the data client side, you don't have to go outside and you can have your whole application load locally because again it's getting that data local on your device it's getting the saved website essentially from the service worker all that hopefully just works just fine in my repo that i'll share it has a very basic implementation of you click a button it updates your index db and works offline you click that button a whole bunch offline still updates the db you come back online it works the exact same so let's get into some software options here. I have three different projects that are, I think are the most interesting in this space. Replicash is the one that I think is getting a lot of hype right now. Replicash is interesting because it's closed source and you sign up with a license, but the license is pretty reasonable as far as pricing goes. You can get, it's funny, it's like monthly active profiles. If you're less than 1,000 monthly active profiles, it costs nothing. And this is only if, your project is commercial. If your project is non-commercial, Replicash is free. So if you're just trying this out and you're not making money on it, you can just use this thing. So that's great. That's Replicash great. handles a lot of things for you. It handles the syncing to an index DB. It handles uh, syncing in general, syncing over WebSocket. You don't have to worry about the WebSocket code. And it handles the conflict resolution stuff. So what you end up getting out of it is you get something that works with anything because you just point it to a URL for your push and pull for your API layer. You connect it to your application, you can connect it to a database, and you are essentially able to, with one step, well, not one step, it still takes a little bit. I have a, I have a, a folder that shows you how to do this in a Svelte Kit app. But what it's cool about this, again, it handles a lot of the kind of pickier stuff that YJS will do. And that's great. As a friendlier project, I'd say this one is definitely friendlier. Okay. Um, so it's yeah. It, it's essentially a state management library. Like you would do all of your getters and setters via Replicash if this is something you use? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Or you could I the way I did it is I synced it to a uh a Svelte kit rune, like okay. a uh, state rune, which is just just keeping it in sync. So I was using the Svelte rune as my local data source, but then it would keep it in sync. Uh and you could probably also use like a like a proxy, um, which is an object which you intercept the get and sets on. Mm. And you yep. could just like like that's how some of these nice state management libraries which is like you're like person dot age equals 100 and behind the scenes 
it's not just putting a, a number on the object. It's actually intercepting that and running a method, and you can put your own logic in that via a proxy. Yeah. Okay. So Replicash cool. is a more simple version of YJS. YJS, you got to do a little bit more yourself. That's okay. In fact, when I lined up the code by code with Replicash and YJS, YJS in my basic example wasn't that much more complex. That said, uh, I think over time it would be. And lastly is Electric SQL, which aims to be Electric SQL aims to do even more for you than Replicash. And again, I think this one is a little bit more of a buy-in. Again, they, they say it's the missing sync layer. So this one, again, is trying to be a nice sync layer. But in reality, you kind of end up using it like an ORM in many ways. You do connect it to your own database. It does work with Postgres. It's specifically for Postgres, which is, you know, People using SQLite or, or MySQL are out on this one, but it does more. So if you're looking for a more, more friendly option, Electric SQL is the one. And there are, by all accounts, more even more expensive and more simple ones. That's kind of how it goes, right? Yeah. So let's talk about the very most basic offline or local first app. Okay. The very most basic one. You initially load the app the very first time you load the app. Your app gets cached via service worker the data gets stored into an index DB. You go offline or anytime you load the site, even online, it should load the site <laughs> from the index DB. It should be instant. It shouldn't have to go to the network. So at its very most basic, that's it, right? Where it gets more complex is when you need to go beyond just a local data store, right? Which most websites probably do, right? You probably need a remote data store somewhere at some point at some time. So <laughs> that this is where things get, get tricky because um, you do need this syncing between a local database and an external database. And that's where it really gets more complex. Either way, the benefit of having a simple local first app in this way is that you get near instant writes, like near instant writes, near instant reads. And if you're doing something that requires that or that would feel nice, maybe a here's a basic example that everyone's made a ton of, a to-do app, right? Yeah. Uh, if your to-do app is taking, you know, 200 milliseconds to return from the network just to check a to-do, then that's probably a good situation where local first could come in handy. In fact, I first got into this stuff because I was working on my habit tracker app. And the way that I solved my habit tracker feeling slow is just by adding optimistic UI, right? It, it, the UI thinks that it's a success, even if it doesn't know that it's a success. And yeah. then it, you know, collects whether that it was a success later. However, a local first is kind of better than that because again, it's saving everything to your database and then just syncing in the background. Either yeah. way, you don't, your application will feel native fast. So that's syncing, um, if I'm understanding what you've told me so far, is that you're, you're in the browser, you make changes to your data type, it syncs it to, to index DB, um, and then when there is network available, it will then send it to the server. The server part, does YJS do that part as well? Um, yes. Like, does it connect to a database? Am I writing my own resolvers that then save to the database and pull the data out? Or, or does it also do everything soup to nuts with the database. So YJS will not touch your database. Okay. Um, I think there's extensions for it that, that do like community based extensions that do more there. Yeah. Uh, but in, in reality, you're using YJS to understand where, like which piece of data is it this data or is it this data? Which one is the most up to date one? And it kind of puts them in a, uh, like a do this, then this, then this, then this scenario. Okay, so who sends the data from the browser to your server? Then the is that what the WebSocket? Okay, and then okay, okay, and then you have a server WebSocket running that just listens for data coming in, and then you save that data. By the time it hits your server, you're not concerned about it being possibly conflicted, crudited. Yeah, well, it, de <laughs> it depends on what you know. If you have an if you have an app that yeah. is multiplayer like Notion. You have something like Notion, that gets more tough, right? Because you have data coming in from different sources, you have data in the database, and you have to data understand. Data here, data here, data here. Portlandia reference, have, anyone? Yeah. 
Okay. I don't know that reference. <laughs> no, actually, okay. Someone will get it. <laughs> uh, if you have like a, a, a to-do app, that's way more simple, right? It's like, I am a user. I've checked this to-do. It goes up. All right. Check the data in the database. Is it is it more recent or not? And okay. YGIS will handle that stuff, but it's not easy. That's why a lot of these tools that you'll see around here are like, oh, we take care of the syncing. We take care of the local database and we take care of the remote database. Okay. Uh, there are services out there that do that and do it well. Uh, I but see. again, you're, you're, you're signing up for something, right? You're, you're buying all in. Whereas like you said earlier, you might already have a database and you might have a tech stack where you need to, to work with that. Yeah. You will see projects in all phases of this, this, like I do everything for you to, yeah. I just handle the conflict part to, I handle the syncing part to, I handle, you know, I, there, there's all sorts of different projects in this space. Okay. Uh, so in a much more complex app, like we've been saying, yeah, you have your, your online app loads, it caches it to a service worker. It saves the data to a database, a local database, an index DB database in the background, it syncs to your remote. Um, the remote syncs back to your local. The service worker is for offline. The data, once it saves local, it syncs to remote. If a data is changed remote, it comes into a WebSocket and syncs to local. It, when I was trying to do a, like a um, flow chart for this, there's just lines pointing everywhere. I was telling my <laughs> yeah. wife, I'm like, I'm trying to learn this stuff, but I feel like that GIF of, Charlie from It's Always Sunny, yeah. where everything's like connected. I'm like, this is this is literally the technology I'm trying to work with right now. It's just lines connecting everywhere. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So, okay, let's talk about some big concepts here. State lives in the database. They often talk about like, hey, when you use an app uh, and you leave the app and you come back to the app, usually the state's like the same in all accounts, really, right? You have Safari, you close Safari, the tabs that you had open are, are still open, those types of things. So one of the ideas here is that a lot of people are putting all kinds of app state directly into the index DB. And they're even putting it into the DB no matter what, because that way, if I set something on my phone, it's the same way in my desktop, it's the same way elsewhere, right? So a lot of the state lives in an in index DB, or in your database in general, just just to keep state everywhere. So that's like a really interesting uh, way that people tend to work in these things, right? Just that that alone is a big shift from the way you typically think. And because of that, you'll see a lot of these apps, they do kind of take that space of a state management library, like you mentioned, right? Like this electric DB has its own hooks, React hooks, if you wanted to have it be your React oh, okay. state library. Yeah. So let's talk about some questions that people have. What about SSR here? Like what does server-side rendering look like in this world? Well, the initial load necessarily isn't as important as long as the data gets into the index DB and as long as the service worker works, that initial server-side could be a client-side render only, it could be a server-side render, it could be anything. That's not necessarily a concern. But I think that one thing you'll notice when you look into which applications specifically benefit from local-first architecture SEO is not typically a concern for that, yeah. right? Maybe it's your landing page. Your landing page doesn't need to be local first. I mean, it, that that could be simple. That's just a service worker, right? But uh, like, does your to-do list need to be server-side rendered? Probably not. And because of that, you end up getting into spaces where you're only doing client-side rendering, and it makes things way easy. I know we we just had episodes on HTMX. It's like, throw everything back to the server. Yeah. And largely in this world, it's like, no, 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 throw everything onto the client. So much to the point where everything runs on the client, even the database, you know. Man. Well, eventually, it's kind of already a thing with the uh, whole web container spec is eventually you'll be running the back end in the browser as well, you know. Yeah. Like, it, yeah. that's not a joke. That's what... Uh, Who's behind web containers? I always mix up these Git pod, stack blitz, uh, stack blitz <laughs> stack is behind pod. them. Stack, all these like coding in the browser things. Stack blitz is behind it. So stack blitz has something that will run Node.js in the browser, which is wild to me. But yeah, it's, it, it's, I think this is the perfect example of like, sometimes the tech depends on what you mm -hmm. want. It's not one or the other, right? It's not, HTMX for absolutely everything and client side rendering is garbage. Obviously there's there's two sides to this type of stuff and if you are going offline, you don't have a server. <laughs> so yeah. you're you're going to need it. And and maybe that's that's a, even another question is like 
we talk a lot about like, oh, it's super fast and whatnot. And I think a lot of people forget because they're they're deving locally on a gigabit hardware mm -hmm. Ethernet connection and they don't realize like, oh yeah, there's there's possibility that these things could be slow or like somebody is ducking into the subway or you have spotty like up at our cottage. I drive when I drive to town, I don't have internet for probably 80% of the drive, you know? And yeah. I have to like make sure that I have Spotify songs downloaded before I, I take that drive. Otherwise it's like I gotta listen to the radio like some like cowboy. And it happens more than you think. And it's not like not necessarily offline conditions, but just slow conditions. I go to dance practice every Thursday. My Wi-Fi signal, for whatever reason, a dance practice sucks. And I, I yep. need an app to help me practice. And I'm sitting at practice with my app to help me practice. And I click a button on it. And I got to wait 10 seconds for a database response. And I'm just like, screw it. I, I can't use this. And I made it. You know, I'm like, I'm responsible for this. And I can't even use it. Yeah, that well, that's another good example is um, like Riverside what we're recording on right now will saves your thing locally and uploads as it can rather yes. than r assuming a fast internet connection. And obviously Riverside is not a local first application because we're talking to each other over the internet. It won't work without the internet, but parts of your application can be local first. And you might want to think about like, Oh yeah, maybe there are pieces of the application that need to be local first with this tech. Yeah, there's tons of applications where this makes a lot of sense. And there's tons of applications where it doesn't make a lot of sense. Would your does your blog need to be local first? No. Uh I mean you could load it via a uh, service it worker could, and it could Yeah, be. service workers yeah. would be enough so that yeah, that would somebody be enough. who's yeah. coming back to the coming back to it can get it immediate or if if like you're taking a flight on a plane and you want to download my entire blog so you can read it. You could do that. I you can't do that right now. I don't, I don't have that on my website, but you could. Yeah, I should. But you know, the, there's apps that have done that. You know, was it like, was it Dash or one of these apps that was like, docs yeah, offline? Yeah, docs offline. Yeah, that's the same concept, right? You're saving these things for offline. Or even you think about like, um, you know, I, I go on a flight with Netflix and I want to save some movies offline for my kids, right? I mean, there are a lot of instances where this stuff makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, MB has that and MB is built on web tech, right? So, uh, what about this Apple PWA nonsense? Cause I know it's an inevitable that people are going to be like, I want to do local first, but Apple killed PWAs and you're not wrong. Apple sucks for that, but it doesn't really affect many of the things that we need here, right? Index DB still works. Service workers still work. WebSockets still work. So regardless of what Apple does here, uh, many of these these technologies that you need to do this stuff won't be affected by that. Did you see, um, just talking about the Apple thing, it's yeah. funny because uh, we'll talk about this and it'll probably change by the time this is out. But uh, did you see that the EU is looking into Apple's uh, removal of, of PWAs or their, their treatment I, of it? People they freaked out, man. It. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully that, I, that I hope they look at it so hard that uh, they, they feel Apple feels really bad and changes their decision. You know, yeah. like, you just look and you're like, I'm disappointed. <laughs> I hope so, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, you might be thinking I recognize a lot of these things from real time and multiplayer. We talked a little bit about this. But yes, the same technology is frequently used in multiplayer stuff. You'll often see CRDTs talked about just as much in multiplayer application as you do in WebSockets. Figma has a ton of articles on CRDTs and, and technology that they've developed there or how they do syncing. That stuff is extremely fascinating, even if you're not building Figma. You might be thinking, hey, this all sounds like too much work. Well, triplet.dev is just one of many services that I found that handles everything for you. If you want like the super base of this stuff, triplet. Uh, triplet is an open source database. You can host it yourself that syncs with data between the server and the browser in real time. It gives you TypeScript, real time sync, offline support, relational queries, works everywhere. Doesn't, doesn't matter which, uh, Front front end framework you want to use it with, even React Native, right? So if you want the easiest possible solution, there's stuff like that. Uh, again, you're paying for it, or you're hosting yourself. Even better, right? That sounds neat. Uh, Electric SQL is like the next step down. If you don't mind a little bit of work, Replica Cache is the way to go. Um, there's more like Evolu. Evolu. 
don't know, it's like play on the word evolution or something dot dev, which is also really interesting because it used Keasley, which is an ORM that people are liking. It has a CRDT. It uses SQLite in the browser. Yeah, a lot of cool stuff. Uh, if you want to go as deep as possible and you want to become, you know, a Jedi master at this stuff, go to YJS. It's, it is intimidating. It will kind of make you um, a little frustrated at points and just a little bit frustrated at points, but it's um, definitely worth it to, if you're interested, like seriously interested in this tech, it's worth it to spend the time learning YJS, even if you're not going to use it, simply as a means of getting a better handle on this stuff overall. Sometimes I think that like people always reach for the service, right? Why reinvent the wheel? The wheel's already been fixed. But sometimes reinventing the wheel exists to help you understand concepts and help you learn, even if maybe that's not what you're shipping. But there's no harm in learning the underlying tech behind a lot of this stuff, even if it is obnoxious and hard. Um, I have some links for you here. Local first web.dev is the best place to really get a handle on the players in this world. There is a great uh, YouTube channel where they post their monthly meetings. In fact, Wes, one of their meetings is literally going on right now. Kyle Simpson from You Don't Know JS is speaking right now on Discord. And this will be published later on the low.fi underscore dev YouTube channel that we'll have linked up. Uh, the Ink and Switch blog post is well worth your time. And then the local first Reddit, they post all of the past shows, the same stuff that's on the YouTube, if you are interested in that. The last link I'm going to have for you here is something I'm putting up right now. And you, you don't, it's not in the, in the notes yet, Wes, but I'm putting it up at this very second. And it's a repo that I made. It's Svelte Kit, but the Svelte Kit stuff is kind of minimal, okay? And... What's interesting about this repo is I did a basic offline or local first counter. Just counts up. Doesn't even count down. Just counts up. Um, and I did it in both YJS and I did it in Replicash. So I did it in both of those two. And you can kind of compare them directly and say, all right, this is what it looks like in Replicash. This is what it looks like in YJS. And it's just the local parts. This does not get into the server side or syncing to a database just yet. But I, I hope to expand upon these little demos even more because it's truly fascinating stuff. Sweet. Man, I, I can't believe how much of a like a huge community this type of thing is. You know, like this is fairly fairly large. So I'm pretty excited to to dip into this and maybe build something myself. Yes. I'm my eventual goal here is to get my habit tracker working in a way that's offline. But yeah. if you're trying to add this to an existing site, man, there's so many moving parts and like I don't want to mess up my existing database yeah. or data stuff. So that like whole what I'm of doing truth thing is tricky. Yeah. I'm getting I'm getting like basic examples working, then I'm getting a to-do list working and then I'll integrate it into my habit tracker. But that's the eventual goal, right? Did you just open source it uh your local first example? Was that you? That was me. I just got a notification. And I'll put it in the show notes. Local first syntax. It doesn't have a readme just yet, but again, it's just two. Two Svelte Kit sites, Replicash and YJS. They're both client side only. Um, they both have instructions, WebSockets. They have a service worker. They, they have all the important stuff. They both work offline, and they both sync across browser windows. So. Sweet. Uh, let's get into some sick picks. Um, I'm going to sick pick. I kind of already did mine. I'm going to pick this dress code dot dev. That's the URL where you can get a shirt like this. Um, it's pretty sweet. The, I forgot to say that like for people not on the video, the there's like a really nice chenille patch on the front. And then the, the back is is puff print, which is really what's popular right patch? now. What do you mean by chenille? that? Um, what's chenille? I can go yell at my wife. She knows all these things. Oh, Chanel? Like the... the. No. Does your Sh wife say Chanel? I trust I trust her judgment on no, this. No, I, I, I just read it, and I, I probably read it wrong. Hold on. Let's see. Are you talking Chanel, about like... Yeah. A wool, the French cotton, luxury silk, brand? Or no, that's Chanel. No. I, that's Chan what I was... I thought you oh, were no. talking about Chanel. Chanel. Like, is Chanel is like... um. Like a fuzzy patch, you know, oh. like if you were to get like a Letterman jacket from the okay. 90s, yeah. you know, I like the, the Captain C would be kind of fuzzy. That's chenille. Yeah. 
And uh, I actually looked into getting syntax chenille patches, but oh. a couple of the suppliers were like, "You, you have to go very large to, mm. for this." But this is this is the smallest chenille patch I've seen. So I'm curious how they did that. Anyways, chenille on the front, puff print on the back, sick shirt, super high quality. Check it out. Dresscode.dev. Nice. I uh I got a lot of letters like uh varsity letters in high school but i never got oh, a yeah? jacket so so i have oh. the the big letters but i never got the jacket because our our school colors were orange and brown <laughs> like who wants an orange oh, and brown yeah. yeah i don't want that um cornies were blue and white they were way cooler I, american high school just seems so wild like i grew up watching like <laughs> clueless and sabrina the teenage <laughs> witch and all these movies clueless. where like people are having lunch outside and like they would have like jackets that's like for the football team and American football and Canadian high mm. school is not, not nearly as cool as that. We had flag football. That was it. Mm. <laughs> well, I got my varsity letters for, do you want to guess what I got my varsity letters for Wes? Um, there are two different things I got varsity letters for. Okay. I'm going to say like, like one of them's for something like, like standing long jump or something silly like that. <laughs> And then one of them I wish I'm a bad jumper. It is cool. Uh wrestling. No, I'm going to tell you They're, right now neither of them are cool. I got uh one one letter for them. academics uh for maintaining <laughs> academics. above academics for maintaining a high GPA for 3 semesters or something. Um, oh, man. And then my other one was for band. So I got band and academics, which are probably the two coolest varsity letters you can get. <laughs> <laughs> I called my I called somebody a keener the other day and my older sister was like, What's a keener? I was like, I You are a keener. Is. If you don't even know what a keener is. That, that means I'm a keener. I've never heard that. No? Uh, oh man. No. How many words do I know that are not something that people understand? The amount of people this is that a Canadian have word. said Is it? Keener's Canadian. Yeah, it's is a, it really? a dictionary.com says a Canadian informal <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> Yeah, oh, that never makes heard a lot it. of sense. The amount of people that have said that they, they like every now and then tweets go popular from like the Korean web development community and I translate them and it says learn English by listening to syntax. And I'm just like, these poor people are learning English from me and Scott. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I famously uh tested into English as a second language in college. <laughs> they they my the advisor was like yeah, I know you, you took the test, you did yeah. your, well, you got into the University of Michigan, but unfortunately, we think your writing is so poor that we want to put you with the people who don't speak English. we are ruining oh. a generation of, of people. Oh. Anyways. Okay, my sick pick is going to be Monarch Money. Um, you know, since Mint shut down, a lot of people are looking for a Mint replacement. This one is not free, so uh, it's it's not necessarily a Mint replacement in that regard. But a lot of these financial tracking apps, I used Empower, which is formerly Personal Capital. I've used YNAB for budgeting. I used Mint. I used a whole bunch of these. A lot of them fall short in a lot of different ways, right? Like Personal Capital does investments really well, but sucks for budgeting. And the UI has been garbage forever. YNAB is really great for budgeting, but sucks at everything else. And honestly, he has not seen an update in a very long time. Monarch does everything really well. The budgeting features are great. The UI is really great. It's the same price as YNAB, so I was able to just swap them out. And it does investments really well. One of my favorite things about this is that it like, uh, what are those charts where you can see like how data flows, like they're often used in analytics to show you how people went from web page to web page. Yeah. Uh, me, this me, shows you where your money is going. So it has all your money over the month. And then it shows this much went over to rent and this much went to your car and this much went to groceries. Sand which is key really diagram. Great to visualize. Sand key. Yeah. yeah. I was, I went deep into the different names for charts on uh, the other day with the Nevo, Nevo charts. Yeah, Nevo. Because I was trying cool. to figure out like what certain charts were called, and mm -hmm. they all have crazy names. The whole data we got to we got to put that episode out on. Oops, I'm a data scientist because there's yes, <laughs> that's a whole world. But you so have you not tried actual budget from James Long? Local first. Yes, let me tell you about actual budget because I have tried actual budget and actual yep. budget's fine. Um, a, there's a a lot of these financial tools, a lot of them that want you to export 
your information from your bank, import it into the app. Or even worse, hand enter everything. Uh, There's yeah. no syncing, right? So like they oftentimes use Plaid uh, for syncing, which connects your your to your financial industry whatever, yep. or your, your, wherever your account is and imports all the transactions. If it does not have syncing, I'm not touching it. Not because... Like I, I get that there's some security implications there of you know giving somebody else your credentials. Yeah. But if I want to actually use a tool, I'm not gonna keep up with it. Yeah. If I, every week I have to input my my money. Into oh it. man, that drives me crazy. I've been battling with FreshBooks for probably two years now because their auto syncing from my bank account mm. has stopped. Right about the time they stop sponsoring the podcast, um, no. <laughs> it's it never works. And like I had a I had a whole call with them. Like I emailed their CEO. And I was like, "This FreshBooks is like crumbling. Like this, the quality of it is just mm. going downhill. And like this thing has never worked properly. And they they keep blaming it on like these Plaid vendors and whatnot. But like I had to write my own exporter and converter that converted QuickBooks format to csv just to import my expenses but holy cow yeah and it sucks it, it every, this stuff should be automatic right and that, that is well worth paying for i totally agree with you there yeah well and and, and if you are going to pay for one i gotta say monarch is great the, the the coolest thing maybe not the coolest thing is the web app is way better than the native app like how often do you see that the web app is is incredible uh, the desktop app adds a whole ton of extra features either way if you even looking just for UI inspiration for this type of thing, they do a great job. I do have a referral code, so if you want, um, if you want to give me that referral, you can click that link. Otherwise, it's just monarchmoney.com. Um, so yeah, a big fan of this. Obviously, not sponsored or anything. It works in Canada. I just assumed, as all things, we don't get it in Canada, but it, it's it's available in Canada. There's probably yeah. some yeah buts in there, but. Cool. I'll check it out. Yeah, it's a cool app. All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll catch you later. Peace. Peace.